Hey everybody, welcome to today's live stream. I'm JK from Animator Island and thanks for swinging by. Uh, we already got some folks in the chat. Um, Hailey says early vid and uh, yeah, I guess it's it's slightly earlier than Ferdinand often will do his videos, but this is a time that tends to work out really well for me in terms of work. So uh, uh, welcome to the stream. Today we're going to be discussing line quality uh, relating to art and it's a fascinating subject and I think we're going to have a lot of good time uh, looking into it. Uh, Infotech says hey, hey Infotech and Tifo's here and we've got a lot of crowd here already. That's good. Um, so today we're going to follow the format that we did last time which is we're going to start out with a little bit of a lecture and theory and then we're going to move into application where we actually analyze some line quality and do some drawing and things and then we're going to have a short Q&A at the end where you can ask about line quality uh, or animation or art, or if it's even remotely generally on topic, maybe even if it's not, feel free to ask. You can always ask the questions during the live stream itself. I'm gonna try and keep an eye on the chat here, but if I miss your question, please copy and paste it at the end during the Q&A because I will do my best to answer as many as I can at that point and I may miss it as the chat is just going by. All right, I think that uh, that covers most of the things. A uh, little bit more housekeeping. Today, I brought a soft box, which is a light, uh, up from the basement studio. So hopefully the lighting is a little bit better than the last live stream. I'm still figuring things out. And the light box may not be here for everyone because I share an office with my wife and I don't really wanna have to have this giant light uh, distracting her all the time. Uh, Tifo asks, where do you work? I actually work from home. Um, one of the fortunate people who get to do that. I have worked from home most of my life, actually. Um, it's not just a pandemic thing. Uh, as a freelance artist, I was able to do that early on. And uh, I have a lot of random jobs. Not a lot of them make money, but that's okay. We, we make it work. And uh, I've been able to work from home most of my life. I tried office life for a while and it did not suit me at all. So I decided probably going to avoid that. I would rather work either outside or at home, not in an office. Office life uh, just drained my soul. Um, but it works for some people. Anyway, I digress. Okay, so let's jump in with uh, with the lecture for today. The uh, I've got some nice little pop-ups and fun things if I could just find it. Still, Still getting used to the streaming thing. All right, so we've got our lecture today on line quality and theory, and I will fire up the iPad and we'll get started. Okay, so uh, this, I, I realized with the last um, live stream that I talk a lot in and uh, gesture and, and such, so my, the size of the screen over here is very small. I thought about maybe using this setup, but it makes the iPad smaller too. So I think we're gonna stick with the, the smaller me because it just, it makes more sense. And then uh, if I, remind me, if I don't put the iPad back up when I'm switching back and forth. The other thing I would note, note real quick is that I realized that when I switch screens and do different things, sometimes there's a stuttering of the video, at least in the recording. So if it seems like I'm off sync for a second or two, uh, forgive me, that's the slowness of my old wonderful computer. So uh, hopefully that won't happen too often. Okay, so today we're talking about line quality. Let's get started. First, I wanted to showcase this uh, beautiful piece by Genevieve Tsai who I highly recommend you look up. I will try and remember to put a link in the description of the recorded part of this video uh, later to her website and her work. She's an outstanding artist. She has such appeal in her work. It's some of my favorite stuff. Um, this particular piece I brought out in terms of line quality. Well, I brought it out for two reasons. First, because I wanted to talk about uh, just the enormous skill that it took to craft this in terms of line specifically. Secondly, because I wanted to talk a little bit about a little bit about physical medium versus digital medium when it comes to line. And so already let me swap screens here real quick. 
no, nope, that's the wrong one. I need the opposite. There we go. Uh, so you see this beautiful image? It's up on her website. Really nice. I am fortunate enough, I mean, just ridiculously blessed to actually possess the original of this piece. So I brought it down from the wall so I could show you guys today. Uh, it was originally done for Inktober, as you can see. I can't see over it and talk. Um, and it's in ink and water. Uh, well, it's it's not exactly a watercolor. It's like a red ink, but it, it feels very watercolory. And uh, boy, I could just sit and stare at this physical print for hours. And the quality that you get to see in that physical print form is very different, or not print, it's, it's actually, you know, the actual ink. But the physical medium is very different than when you see it even digitally, because it's very pretty digitally, but it's, it's on a whole new level when you get to see it in person. And so why I wanted to bring that up as we start is to let you know that it really pays every once in a while to go out there into the real world and see some art. If you happen to have a museum near you, uh, or museum uh, near you, it's really worth going to. Uh, a lot of them will let in like students and things. They have days sometimes when they're free, whatever the case might be. It's really worth going and seeing some physical art done, not digitally. I have nothing against digital art. I mostly work in digital art these days because it's much easier for me to do that. But there's a quality that I think we lose when we switch to exclusively digital. Um, lovely thing is things like Procreate exist now, which are slowly breaking down those barriers. But if somebody does something in charcoal or in real life ink, you're going to get something that's just a little bit different than even the best uh, software can mimic. So definitely recommend you get out there if you get a chance, go to some places, see some real art, take some notes, just immerse yourself in it. It'll really pay off. So anyway, that's all. Okay, today, uh, again, we're talking about line quality. So let's jump in and start with this image. So for starters, I wanted to talk about kind of the spectrum of line. And so I've put together these five images so that we can kind of discuss that. And what you'll see is we'll start with this first image, which is my beloved Foxtrot, which we talked about last time. And what you'll see here is that it is almost exclusively line, or actually it is exclusively line. What we have here is just line, nothing else. And what you'll see is that it's actually very clean line and it's very consistent line. So in art, and forgive me because some folks may already know some of this, but I'm just gonna cover the basics as we begin. In art, we have uh, two styles of line, essentially. You have consistent line, which you'll see here in this video. And that is if I were to get out my blocking brush and I just go straight across, that's a very consistent line. Or you have tapered line. So in that case, you have a line that may start smaller and then get bigger and then get smaller at the end, or you have, may have a line that starts large and then tapers off. This is not the best brush for that. Uh, to do it slowly, I'd have to actually do it quickly, which would be like that or like that. So a tapered line is going to get you a much different feel than a consistent line. And so when we look at this piece by Bill Ammond on Foxtrot, you'll see that the line is very consistent. But every once in a while, there's a little bit of tapering going on. So for example, if you look at uh, Jason's hair here, in these two spots, you see that the line is slightly thicker and then it gets slightly thinner, but it's not an extreme amount of tapering. This is just kind of the result of the tools that he was using in physical form. And so a lot of times you, what you'll get in things like newspaper comics is heavy, uh, line only work because even though you might have some uh, small amount of shading and things like that, this is what shows up really well in newspapers. If you can get this sort of crisp and consistent line, this is what newspaper printers consistently could reproduce. And so it was wise to use this. Uh, this suited what he was trying to accomplish, which was to make an amazing newspaper comic. So that's where we would start with all line. We'll call it all line. 
If we go to this next piece, you will see that it is almost all line, right? So the line here is very different in feel, but it's still mostly line. We have a little bit of fill, what we would call fill in the eyes, right? This is not necessarily line. This is the, the artist filled it in with the, uh, the pencil or the brush. And then under the chin here, you have some shading, which are actually more like cross-hatched line. So it's still technically line, but it's, it comes across more as a fill or a shading. So what I want to discuss between this first one and the second one is that both of them work almost entirely with line. The first one entirely with line and the second one almost entirely. But they have a very different feel, right? Because the second one is not necessarily clean inking. This is more like the, the starting point of the process. This is more of a rough drawing that the artist could later go back and ink like the Foxtrot art. Uh, with a consistent line or a tapered line. But here the artist has, at least for the sake of showing this piece, left it in a rough state. And you can see that the lines uh, tend to be a little more searching, what I would call searching lines. So if you look right down here, you will see that we have a couple different lines kind of curving over in that way. Uh, and what that is, is that the artist is, is going for the movement and going for the feeling, but they're not quite, they don't want to nail it in one shot, which is what you'll have to do if you're working on like ink. So these these lines um, that Genevieve did when when she brought out the brush with the ink, she had to do them in, in essentially one shot. She had to go for it, uh, which is why actually there is uh, an underdrawing. I don't know if you guys can see that, and I don't think it's in the digital version. Maybe it is, but she did the whole thing well, at least some of it. I don't know how much of it because much of it's covered with ink, but she did at least some underdrawing in uh, like a red pencil. And then she went back and did these really confident lines and you get this beautiful quality. But in this instance, the one we see before us is, uh, is a very searching line and it's a very rough line. Uh, Tifo says, sorry, which is your name or how do I call you? Sorry. Uh, my name is JK, JK Riki. I am one of the founders of Animator Island. I haven't been around as much in the past couple of years, but I'm hopefully trying to get back into it and help Ferdinand out by doing some more live streams and mentoring and things like that. Uh, we started the whole thing back together way back in the old days when it was just a little website that was basically a blog. And now look what he's grown it into. It's amazing. But my name is JK. Uh, I think, well, no, it may not be up in the corner. It used to be up in the corner of the screen somewhere, but I don't know how to activate that. That's usually uh, just there when I'm here with Ferdinand, but JK is fine. Back to the lecture. This, uh, uh, so what I want to explain here is that the second piece is not a far cry from the first in terms of line, but the quality is very different and it looks very different. So if we label this one too, we might say that this is all line and we might say that this is mostly all line, but not exclusively all line. And the line is very different. And if we move on to this third one, what you'll see is the artist has now introduced fill and shading and uh, different tones of this kind of rich gray it's, it's slightly a yellow, red, gray. Uh, it's not just a strictly gray, gray, which is another interesting thing. And we'll talk more about that when we have a lecture on color, but it will add quality to your work if you don't just use flat out gray. If you give it a little bit of blue or a little bit of red, it'll, it'll lighten the piece in a way that will add depth. So that's a, just a small tip in case you're interested. Okay, but talking more about line, what you'll see here is that we still have that sort of seeking line, right? Uh, when we zoom in, we see that there are a lot of lines that made up this kind of final image. And then we have some lines which were clearly done in one shot, like see this line here. This is not a seeking line. They just went for it and uh, it has a, a quality of its own in that regard. But what I wanted to say about this one, as we're progressing in these different um, spectrum of line is that 
it's important not to get super distracted if you're analyzing line with things like color or contrast or fill because all of these images well so far all these images have started with line and then they've added on things like color or fill or shading when we see a piece in front of us we might be enamored by that piece i really like this piece i like this piece for a number of reasons one of the reasons i like this piece is the line quality but that's not the only reason I like this piece. And so what you have to get into your head when you're analyzing art is kind of separating all of these things that you like, because you might look at a piece and say simply, I like that. And 99%, well, maybe not 99, but let's say 95% of human beings who walked through uh, a museum or a gallery might look at a piece and just say, I like that or I don't like that. But as artists, when we see a piece we like or dislike, we can step back and say, why do I like that? Or why do I dislike that? And it's important not to get distracted by the whole while we're doing that analysis. So I wanted to point that out with this piece because one of the things that is nice about it is the contrast in colors or grayscale that it's done in. It draws the eye in a different way than something like this piece, which is just line. So we need to separate those things out since we're just talking about line. But on the spectrum that we're talking about, we're going to call this number three, uh, and I'll call it 50-50. It's, it's probably not 50-50, but maybe it's, it's close to 50-50. Here we have 50% line and 50% something else like shading or fill or contrast and things like that. So let me check through the uh, chat here real quick. All right, we'll take us. Um, so there's a there's a question here. I'm going to answer real quick because it seems like a pretty easy one to answer. Um, Tifo says, "I want to know. I'm an animator and I haven't tried animating with a tablet. Do you think it's useful to try it?" Uh, and then goes on to say, "Or do I just keep with a mouse?" I would always recommend a tablet for artists if you're interested in pursuing digital art. Like always, I I have no problem with people creating amazing work with the mouse but you're gonna be fighting the mouse. You, you want technology to help you, not to hinder you, right? So a mouse is going to be harder because it's not designed to do art. It's just not, it's designed to point and click and get places easily and not have supreme precision. Although we now use it for that a lot. Um, so I definitely recommend that you uh, check out a tablet, uh, Lord Luigi uh, waves. Hi, Lord Luigi. And I would, I would recommend that you check out a tablet. You don't need to have a very expensive one. You can get by with some very inexpensive ones these days, but I definitely would recommend that. I use a refurbished iPad Pro and a Generation 1 Apple Pencil and Procreate, and I adore it. I used to have a Cintiq. Well, I still have a Cintiq. It's over there. But I almost never use the Cintiq anymore. I'm honestly considering selling it because I use the iPad Pro almost exclusively now. It's not a knock against the Cintiq. It served me well for like 15 years and I love it. It's one of the best tools I've ever purchased. It was expensive, but it was worth it. It was worth every penny. But um, at this point, I find that the portability of the iPad just suits me really well because then I can just get up and go somewhere. You know, if, if I have another appointment somewhere else, I can just go there. And while I'm waiting for the appointment to start, I just sit down, open up the iPad and start working. So I hope that helps. Um, okay, so back to line. If we move on to number four here, what we will see is that not only have we added color, but we have added shape in the form of no line, uh, well, no line shape. So let me give you an exact example. If you look up here into uh, this lighting around her eye, uh, around the nose and the eye. It is technically made up of small lines. However, it reads as just a shape. And so when we're talking about line, we often think of line like this, which you can see the actual line. But when we do line that comes off as shape instead, it's almost like a lineless quality. Or if you look down here whoops, at the shading under the chin, there's no line there. There's no defined line. It is just 
color next to color, block of color next to block of color, shape next to shape. And so when we get into this fourth category on the spectrum, we would call this, uh, what do we want to call it? Something like some line. Let's call it some line. Because it's still, honestly, it's composed of a lot of line here. And it's beautiful line. And some of the line are colored lines, like here. And some of the line is, well, it's still colored, but it's uh, the type that kind of goes throughout the whole piece, which is nice because that's something you can do with line. And we'll talk more about that as we continue the lecture and the application. Oh, my circle went away. Um, but let's move on to number five here. Number five is easy to describe. It is no line. No line art exists, obviously. Here we go. We have a piece that has no lines in it. There's, there's no defined lines in this piece. It is all form and shape. It is all block of color. And yet we have the indication of line, right? If you look up here at the face, we could say that this is a line, but it's not. It's not a line. It is the separation of uh, it's a separation we get when we have a lighter color next to a darker color and one shape next to another shape. And so this fifth category, I would call no line. And what I think is very interesting is if you go into the real world, this is what you have. You have no line. And it's it's very different to think about the world that way. You know, it, as artists, often we look at the world and we try and sketch it out. And we put down lines to define those shapes and to define edges. But really, there's no edge there. If I hold up my hand, right, you can see my hand against the wall behind me. But there's no outline around my hand. It's not like there's a big black outline like a comic book that defines my hand. My hand is just one color against another color. And you can tell the difference and you can see that outline. So you can define my hand by that shape and by that sort of line, but it's a hidden line almost. And one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite stories, uh, kind of an allegory that I heard, and I'll, I'll di uh, digress for a moment and talk about this a bit. Um, it's by C.S. Lewis, who is my favorite author. C.S. Lewis once wrote a bit of an allegory related to this idea uh, of how line doesn't exist in the real world. And he put it like this. Once upon a time, there was a woman who was imprisoned. She was in a cell, uh, four block walls, stone, and there was a little window at the top, but you couldn't see out the window. It just provided some light. And this woman was imprisoned, and she had a child while she was in prison. This, this baby grew up knowing nothing else but the walls around him. Um, he'd never been to the outside world. And so the mother wanted to explain to him the world around them that wasn't just the cell, what was outside the cell. So she had some chalk for some reason, um, but she found some chalk, she had some chalk or somebody slipped her some chalk and she began to draw on the stone walls all the wonders of the world. And she explained it to him as he grew up and she told him about sailboats and oceans and, and trees and all these things that he had never seen before. Well, by and by, uh, the, the, the sentence is up and she's released from prison and the child is released as well. And they walk out into the light of the real world and the boy is just flabbergasted. He's taken aback. He's shocked. And he turns to his mother and says, where are all the lines? Because the only reason that we don't think about line versus no line is because we grew up in this real world where there aren't lines, but where we can interpret lines in shapes and in forms. But if you grew up only knowing line, then you would look around the real world and be like, oh my gosh, this is so different, right? Because it really is. Uh, when we think about line, we're not really mimicking reality at all because there aren't lines in reality. So I hope that that is understandable. I think that it's really interesting because, um, it helps us to remember that even though we're putting lines on a paper or on a screen, that's not really what's in front of us. It really isn't. Those lines are representative. They're symbolic. So uh, here we have kind of our spectrum 
of line. We go from all line all the way to no line and the things in between. And uh, one thing that I want to talk about before we jump to the next slide is, as you know, I'm trying to create my own style. I'm trying to change the current style I have to something that appeals to me more and I want to work in. And what I've determined is that I do not want to work in no line and I do not want to work in all line. And I think if you're developing your style, or even if you're not, it, it's just, it pays to do this sort of analysis. It helps to know what you don't want to do. Last stream, we talked a little bit about beauty. And I talked about how I want to do beautiful work. Like I want beauty to be a part of my work. I don't want to draw ugly things. And so those are two sides of the same coin, right? Because I know what I want to do, but it also pays to know what I don't want to do. I don't want to create ugly things. I don't want to create grotesque things. And to be fair, the word grotesque is probably a better one to use because nobody really wants to make ugly things, right? But some artists do want to work with the grotesque. They want to create creepy, uh, maybe even disgusting things, but they still want it to be quote unquote beautiful. They want it to be well-crafted, I should say, right? So it's that difference between something that's pretty and something that's well-crafted, and then also something that's grotesque, but still well-crafted, if that makes sense. So when it comes to line, I have determined that even though most of my life I worked in this first category, I don't wanna do that anymore. That's not what I wanna do. Um, but I also don't wanna to go to the opposite extreme and work in no line because I enjoy working in line. Uh, gesture drawing, for example, is one of my favorite things. And that's almost exclusively line because you don't have enough time to, to not work in line in that case. You could still do it in, in painting style, I guess. But at any rate, I don't want to work in no line and I don't want to work in all line. Uh, my, my goal here is to get somewhere in the middle because that's what I want this Riki style, my own style to be like. Uh, so hopefully that is understandable. And, um, and again, it really pays to know what you don't want to do along with what you want to do, because both of them will help you to kind of get pushed into that middle ground where that is what I want to do. Uh, and it's just easier to analyze if you look at it, both of them. So let's take a look at a couple Disney examples, because we're probably all animators here. And if not, who doesn't love a good 2D animated Disney film? If we look at specifically the line quality of these three images, we'll start with the rescuers here. We've got two rescuers and an emperor's new groove. If you look at the line quality of uh, Bernard here, you will see that it is a very rough style. It's It's got toothsomeness to it. I think that that's the best way to put it. It, it has that quality of almost in areas that searching line, right? You can see it a lot right here. And let me switch to a brighter thing since it's dark. You can see it a lot right here where there's just this jaggedness to the line because the animator of this particular frame was specifically uh, doing it slightly rougher. Now, it's, it's likely that this was still cleaned up afterwards, but even the cleanup artist in those days would continue to try and uh, recreate some of that initial toothsomeness, that initial appeal, in my opinion, of the original animator. And so that's a very interesting thing to see in these early, earlier Disney, 2D Disney animated films, because they still seem completely finished, right? It's not that they seem unfinished, but they have this quality to them that's different. Because if we go to the second one, which happens to also be the rescuers, but this is the rescuers down under, you will see that a lot of that is gone. If we look at some of the same areas on Bernard on this one, the line quality and the line um, weight and things are very consistent by comparison. They still have tapering and things like that, but there's, they've lost that roughness because Disney as a whole, as a studio, moved on to something else um, past that roughness. And then we go down to the Emperor's New Groove. Wow, here we see crisp, clean line. Like gone is almost all of that toothiness. And now we have the line in specific colors. And so it's vastly different than if we go up to 
our old rescuer friends where it was definitely black line and it was definitely kept toothy uh, and rough. And so that's just some of the difference between um, while well, these styles of animation, but also of line quality and that sort of thing. So hopefully that makes a lot of sense. Here we're going to talk uh, a minute about 101 Dalmatians, the 2D animated film. This is a fascinating film because the way they did it was actually slightly different than they had been doing in the past. And I believe that they did in the future. In 101 Dalmatians, there is a, a much more toothy and rough line quality to the cells themselves, cells themselves than there was before and there will be afterwards because of the process that they used. And it's it's beautiful to see that they, they gave this a shot. And then the other thing I want to talk briefly about is the backgrounds here. The backgrounds in 101 Dalmatians are fascinating and they're totally worth just going and looking up themselves. What you will see is that they put block of color as the fill of the different lines. Almost everything in the background of 101 Dalmatians is line but then they took solid colors and they just kind of slapped them on in different spots in different ways and they gave it this very unique style so if you look for example at this book right this book isn't filled in all the way it's not it it has the paint behind the cell uh behind the line in a very graphic way and again here like uh where was the other one this yeah. Oh, here. This book, I knew I had another example. This book is another one. Like instead of all the pages being white and then the spine being this kind of olive green, they just put a flat line of or a block of color that creates this line right slapped it underneath. And while you you feel it, but you don't necessarily notice it because you're looking at the actual animation and you look at these cups, too. This cup handle isn't even filled in. I didn't even bother. It's, it's there. You know what it is, but it's not filled in. And so it's fascinating to see how they combined line and color in this film. I definitely recommend, if you get a chance, go look at some of the backgrounds. This is a, an exterior shot. Again, what we see here is line, 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 line. This is very line heavy. You see very little shading. You see very little uh, anything but line and then block of color. And again, the block of color is not even in the lines. This is this is coloring outside the lines here. And it works beautifully. And it creates a style that I think is unique to this film. And personally, why I think this is one of the best Disney films, artistically speaking, that there is. It's just epic. All right, last one. We'll talk about Disney-wise, and then we'll move along. Here we have a night and day difference between line, right? We have... On the left here is a sketch done by Glenn Keane. I'm pretty sure it's Glenn, Glenn's work of Rapunzel and Max. And then on the right, we have the rendered 3D Max and Rapunzel and Pascal's up there too on the top of her head. But here we can see, you know, the absolute difference between all line and no line. And both are great, uh, uh, but they definitely have a different quality to them. They definitely have a different feel. And it's important for us to know what we're doing or you know, what we want to do while we're, we're tackling that. So let's talk about these four images because this uh, here we'll talk a little bit about um, quality and weight of line uh, specifically, as well as color of line and things like that. So starting over here, what you'll see in this image is that we have some pretty chunky, hefty lines, right? This is not, generally speaking, light lines, but we do have light lines incorporated in with the heavy lines. So if you look at this line in the back of her neck, for example, it is extremely thick and it's extremely solid. But if we look at the lines of her hair, they're very light. And as that contrast happens between the two, we can get an appeal that only comes when we have contrast. The other thing I wanna note is, for example, this line at the back of her, uh, well, sort of a ponytail, pigtail, um, this line is a beautifully tapered line, right? It starts super thick and then it gets very thin. 
but you don't see that in all of the other lines of this piece. Like there could be tapering on this ear, but there's not, it just ends. There could be more tapering uh, on this neckline. It tapers here a little bit, but it's, it's generally pretty consistent and solid. So it's a really neat blend of tapering and consistency of line of bold graphic lines and then very subtle and nice lines. And then we even get some notes too, right? Because in this area on the shading or the lighting on her fuzzy coat, we don't even have a line. So I think that that's really interesting to look at. If we go up here to this one, you'll see again, much more of that seeking line. If this first one had final confident line throughout, there really isn't much in terms of seeking lines. This is kind of like finished inked quality line. I would imagine that the artist did an underdrawing first and then inked over top, but I don't know that. This one, on the other hand, has some of those seeking lines still. It probably was inked over top of an underdrawing as well. However, they kept a lot of those searching lines. And I think that that lends itself a quality that is very appealing personally. So I really like this. If I had to say, which of the two I would want for my own style, I'm probably leaning more towards this one than I am this more graphic one. However, I really love uh, how, how bold and graphic the one on the left is. So there's nothing to say that I can't experiment with all of them. It's just that if I was going to say my default is one thing versus another, I'd rather have my default be more like this. And so that's good to know as I'm analyzing for my own style. All right, down here we have something pretty dramatically different, right? Because we have very bold lines. And for the most part, these very bold lines are also very consistent. There's a little bit of tapering in some spots, but again, we're talking about for the most part. And we see that the artist uses very thin lines in some places and very thick lines in other places. But again, for the most part, we're talking about this very hefty, very thick line that gives it a certain graphic style and the line here is colored right so in this first piece the line is almost entirely black the hair lines uh, are the only ones that really i think the hair lines and maybe this cheek lines are the only ones that are are colored differently but otherwise we have a very black thick line and then this one the lines are this is a lighter line than this one, but I believe that the line is the same color. It's just a different uh, lightness to it. Um, so it's still one color. In this one, it, it, we have one color too, but it's so bold and it's so graphic that it sets it apart. It's very different because of that uh, that color, or that the, the choice to make it a color. If this color, the line color on this one was just black, it would give it a very different feel it softens it. It makes it, uh, it makes it more pleasing to look at, in my opinion, to have this slightly different color. Now, in terms of my own style, there was once upon a time when I did more of this kind of style. Uh, my lines were very chunky and consistent and bold and graphic, and I don't dislike that. But for the most part, that is not what I'm looking for in my next style that I'm developing. I don't. I will again. If we go back to these, just between these two now, I will say that I would still rather do this one than this style. But if we were going to compare these two, then I would say I'd rather do this one than this. And by having these comparisons and, and analyzing it in this way, I'm starting to get an idea of the direction I want to head uh, and then also the direction I don't want to go. So even though I really like this image at the bottom here, I really enjoy it. It's not what I want to do. And that's important to know. And then finally, we'll go over there to this one. What you'll see with this one is it's kind of got a nice combination of a little bit of everything. It doesn't really have any seeking lines, though. This is very clean art. And I haven't decided yet whether I want uh, my art to be this crisp and clean versus having more seeking lines. I see the appeal in both, and I just don't know. So maybe today we'll discover that as we do the application and analysis. But one thing that I did want to point out here is that uh, this artist colored the line based on what's around it, right? So if you look at the color of the line on her hand, 
it's a reflection of her skin tone. But if you look at the color of the line on her hair, it is a reflection of the color of the hair. And so it's a really nice way to change things up a little bit. And it, it adds an extra quality to the art that is very appealing. And I really like that. So that's another thing I'm going to have to determine. Do I want my line color to be consistent? Do I want it to be just black? Do I want it to be like an ochre shade like this one, which is very appealing to me, or like a blue shade? Or do I want to go the direction of making all my lines different colors? I don't know. We'll find out. And uh, we got to keep thinking about it. But those are just some different examples of line and quality. Last thing we want to talk about during the lecture, and then we're going to jump into application, is texture of line. Okay, so if we zoom super close in here on this drawing, what you will see is that this line is textured. You can see the texture of it. Hopefully you understand what I mean by texture. If, if I take this brush that I'm using right now, you can see that it is a very textured brush. Whereas if I go to my blocking brush, you can see that it is very solid and it doesn't have any texture to it this dramatically changes the overall appearance of your entire drawing or work because that toothiness, that texture, uh, is an element that will just change the entire feel. And so if we go over here to Tongs, who is one of the characters from my series Mythic Ranch, Tongs is done in a very clean and no textured line. So this line is more like the blocking brush, and this line over here is more like my beloved tinderbox, which has a little more toothiness. And if we go up to this dry ink base, you can see it even more, right? This dry ink base brush that I have at the top of my favorite list is very, very textured. And uh, it, it has a different feel to it than the solid thick line uh, or, or smooth line of my blocking brush. Now, when it comes to these two, right now, I'm leaning more towards um, a non-textured line. I don't dislike textured lines. I really, I, I enjoy them. And when I'm working roughly, I almost need a textured line. It, it allows me to seek better. But when I'm doing final art, I think, and I think, I don't know, this might change. I think I want a solid line rather than a textured line just in terms of my own personal preference. So we're gonna see, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, right now I'm leaning towards having a solid line versus a textured line. So I hope that makes sense and it gives you a little bit of an overview of, of line and quality of line and things like that. The other thing that we didn't talk about but we probably will in the next section on application is how confidence really matters when it comes to line because if you're confident in your lines and your abilities, you will be able to make strokes that are very definitive and they're appealing because you can feel the confidence that was in them. Whereas if you are a new artist or a young artist, what you'll find is that you tend to have very, very short and very uncon -con unconfident. Your lines will lack confidence when you're, when you're starting out. And that just happens. That's just what it is. You will, you will try you, because you're just nervous still. You don't know if you, if you can trust what your hand is going to do. And the, one of the nice things about digital art is it allows you the freedom to have a little more confidence, right? So if we go back to Genevieve's uh, beautiful drawing here, or or ink, really, because we're talking about the the inking and the line. Her confidence came through in those lines, and she was able to just do them in real ink on the paper, but she only had one shot. There was no eraser. There's no undo button. You can't double tap that screen. So when we work digitally, especially early on, we have to uh, be aware of and also a little bit be careful of the fact that we have such easy access to undo. It's good to use it. You should use it. It will free you up to be able to do confident lines, but just be aware that you shouldn't rely so heavily on it that you can never pick up a pen and also do a drawing, right? So you can, you can in digital art, almost uh, clean things up too much. You can, you can get uh, just 
obsessive about it. And you just got to be careful that you don't let that happen. But at any case, that's going to conclude our lecture for today. And then we're going to move on to our application. So let me open up our line quality file. And today we are going to be analyzing line quality for, again, Reiki style. And if I pull up our little uh, ticker thing. All right, we've got our application analyzing line for Reiki style. Just as a reminder, or if you are not here for the other lectures or the other live streams, I am currently in the midst of trying to redo my own style, uh, my art style, because for most of my life, I drew in line only, and it was very comic book style. It was uh, consistent and bold line because my dream was to work in newspaper comics. That dream didn't become a reality and that's okay. Sometimes that happens. I had other things and I'm very pleased with my life. So I am not complaining at all, but it does mean that now that I want to work on something other than newspaper stock comics, I have to change my default style. I have to change the habits that I've built up over 30 years so that I can produce the work that I want to produce. And so what we're doing here in the application section and the analysis is I'm trying to figure out what I want my style to be so that I have it like in front of me. And then when I'm starting to produce work, I don't have to think in the back of my head, is this the style I want to use? Because I'll know, I'll know what style I want to do for the most part. Now, a lot of art is experimentation. So there will be days that I don't want to work in my style. Maybe I'll want to do some lineless art for one day or a week or a year. It doesn't matter. I can do that if I choose to. But what this Reiki style that I'm calling it uh, is to be is going to be me trying to make a style that I'm genuine, uh, generally pleased with that will be appealing to me and will make me want to do the work. Because if you don't want to do the art, uh, if you're fighting the art, you know, we talked about earlier, kind of fighting the tools or fighting the art, it won't be nearly as pleasant of an experience. Uh, it's going to be much harder. So you want to try and get that, that comfort, uh, that element of comfort while you're doing the work. So that's why I'm doing this uh, analysis. And that's why I'm trying to change my own style so that I can get to that place. Okay. So. Let me get a drink of water and then we're going to start analyzing some pieces for line quality. I selected these pieces from some of my favorites category. Not all of them are in that 108 drawings that are, or images that I put together to develop the style, but most of them are. And I pulled them because they each have elements of the line quality or the line style or something about them line wise makes me compelled to look at them and want to do something like them. So we're going to go through them one at a time. And we're going to kind of take a look at that. I will say this, none of them, as far as I can tell is exactly what I want to do. When I was young, uh, the reason I had developed the style that I have to this point is because what I wanted to do was Foxtrot. There wasn't any difference. It wasn't, I want to do something like Foxtrot and like something else. No, I wanted to do exactly Foxtrot. That was my favorite. That's the thing I wanted to do. Uh, I recognize now that a lot of it was the writing and the jokes and the quality uh, of, of the stories and characters. But at the time I saw Foxtrot, I read Foxtrot, I loved Foxtrot. And I thought, well, that just means that that style is perfect, which means that that's what I should do. So I copied it directly. And that became sort of my style. Uh, it really wasn't my style, but it, it became that because that's just all I practiced. So in this case, so far, as I'm developing this new style, I have found no image, no one image that is exactly what I want. You know, I look at it and I'm saying, that's it. That's the one. If I if I just copy that exactly, that's, that's what I want. Nothing, nothing that I found. And I have thousands and thousands of images that I have looked at every day. I spend probably at least 20 minutes just browsing online, looking at art uh, to pull things and to see quality and stuff like that. But I've never found one single image that's exactly what I want. So we're going to go through these images, which have elements that I like, 
and we're just gonna we're gonna observe and talk about the line. Okay, so let's start with this one. This is one of my favorite pieces of all the pieces that I have uh, collected. This is one of my favorites. There are so many things about this that I love, and I'm sure over time we'll talk about all the aspects. But today it's really important that I keep focused, and we're just gonna talk about line. We're just gonna talk about line because I could start gushing about everything else I love about this piece. We're not talking about the rest. Okay, let's analyze the line itself. Uh, Tangible says, hi, how are you? Hey, Tangible, welcome to the stream. I'm doing fantastic this morning. Thank you for asking. I hope you are as well. Um, okay, so looking at the line of this piece, the first thing that jumps out to me is this shoulder. Oh, hang on. I am drawing on the wrong layer. Okay, here we go. First thing that jumps out to me is this shoulder. The shoulder has a, a weight to it that contrasts other parts of the drawing. So if we contrast this shoulder with this cheek slash chin specifically, look at the difference in size of line and weight of line. It's, it's pretty stark. It's, it's a big contrast. I really like this because this contrast is what I think gives art a lot of its appeal. Contrast in shapes, contrast in forms, contrast in colors, contrast in line. I really like this. So what I want to remember as we're analyzing, as I'm going back later to write my notes of this is what I want to do and this is what I don't want to do, I want to keep in mind that I like a variety of line weight personally. Some artists do amazing things with uh, one weight of line. Uh, I wish I could remember the name of the one. I, I literally studied a lot of what he's done. And I, forgive me, I cannot remember his name, but um, I'll, I'll try and remember to add it into a future live stream. He just what, uses one light, weight of line the whole time. And it, it astounds me because he gets so much appeal in his work and I don't know how he does it. Uh, Foxtrot too. Foxtrot for the most part uses one weight of line and I still love the art. I might not want to do the art, but I still love it. But going forward, I would like my lines in Riki style to have this sort of weight uh, changes and this sort of difference. Other things that we can look at line wise, there aren't a lot of seeking lines here as far as I can see. Um, so we talked a little bit about that earlier where you'd have uh, final lines and you'd have seeking lines. This piece does not have much in terms of seeking lines. You could make an argument for like, if you see right here, there's this little line. You could make an argument that that's almost a seeking line. I don't know. You can make an argument. And if you look down here where they don't quite meet up, you could make an argument that that is a its own certain quality because the artist could have, if they wanted to, cleaned that up. Whoops. They could have cleaned that up perfectly, right? So that that little bit of extra was not there. They could have done that. They didn't. They chose to leave that little bit. Now, whether that was you know, a timing thing, like they just were done with the piece and they moved on, or they made that intentional choice, I don't know. But I kind of like that aspect personally of a little bit of roughness, just a little. Maybe not all the way to some of the earlier stuff we saw, but I kind of like that little bit of roughness. It adds a charm to it that I think you lose if you clean things up so much that it's just like almost vector art. It gives that human element maybe a little bit. I don't know. So that's kind of what I have to analyze about this piece. Um, last thing I would say, I guess, is in the face specifically, uh, the hair is almost its own its own beast. So I'm ignoring the hair for right now. I really like it and I'll analyze it another day, but we're just going to talk about this lower portion for now. One thing that we can note is that the line is almost exclusively black line, right? If we color pick this line, it's going to be, well, this, the opacity on this brush is different. Let me get this one. The, um, the color on this, on all of these lines is black. 
So here's an artist who used strictly black line. Now, they had elements um, of not black line. So for example, if we look right here at the collar, which I, I also just as an aside, I love that they didn't fill this. This is the background just shining through. They just erased that. I really like that. It's a really cool idea. I really neat. Anyway, but under that, what you will see is that uh, this line is, well, actually that one might not be. This line over here is white. They used a white line for an accent here. And uh, on the shoulder here, they have their um, highlight in line, and it's a different color than just black. Well, you couldn't just use black, but it's also a different color than white. So they did incorporate a couple instances of colored line here, but they did not, uh, going back to some of those earlier ones we saw, they didn't go back and color the lines unique to whatever was next to the line. So they could have taken the skin tone and then taken it darker a bit and maybe changed the hue a smidge. And they could have made this line this color, right? But they didn't. It would change the feel of the piece if they had. If they had made the color of the line uh, strictly a color instead of black, it would change the feel of the entire piece. And that's something that I think it's important to keep in mind um, while we're working. Do we want colored lines? Do we not want colored lines? Do we want all one color lines, even if it's not, um, if it's not black, maybe we want all blue lines, even if the character skin is this more uh, mocha color, whatever the case might be, we need to know those things. And we can play around and experiment too. So we could just learn as we go. That's fine. But if we're analyzing and we're trying to develop something, we need to know. So regarding that, I think this is beautifully done in just a black line. Do I want only a black line? I don't know yet. I haven't figured that out. If I took one thing away from this piece, it is at least that I want contrast in line weight but I don't know if I want to work in black line or colored line or anything of that nature yet. Uh, the other last thing I would say is this line is non-textured. Uh, so that's important to note. However, you can see there's a lot of texture here, right? So it's not that we avoid texture entirely. It's that the lines themselves are not textured and I rather like that. So. I probably am going to end up putting a lot of texture in my work because texture adds a lot of feel and appeal, but I'm not going to put it on the lines themselves, probably. Again, we'll, we'll see as we go. Okay, moving on to this piece. Um, this piece is tricky because the quality of craftsmanship of the drawing and the characters and the world building and everything about that really appeals to me. So I have to be very careful that I'm not uh, drawn so much to those things that I'm not thinking uh, that I'm thinking about things other than the lines. We're just talking about the lines today. I have to keep hammering into my own head. This is about line. Stop talking about how amazing those sheep are or those uh, whatever they are. I love them. Anyway, <laughs> if we just look at line here, we'll notice a couple things. First of all, the line weight is extremely varied. We can see that just in this section alone. Let me go back to my deep purple. If we see just in this section alone, you will see that the line weight varies pretty dramatically. The bottom part of, or even just this elbow, is a much lighter and much, um, much lighter in weight and much lighter in tone line than this uh, darker line above it. And if we look at places even still, same place, we see that this line is also very light and very, very light in both weight and in tone. So there's a lot of variety of line here, and I appreciate that. But there, it also is, as far as I can tell, exclusively black line again. Um, everywhere here is just black line. Oh, wait, maybe not. Mm, that's a good question. So right here, on the uh, on the material, the question is: Is that just so light in black that it's reading as a green line, or is it actually a green line? Hmm. 
I, I'm not sure. But it does read as a green line. So even if the artist used black here, it reads as a different color line, which is probably the most important thing. And we can look at the hat here too. No, mm, this is tricky. I don't know if they used black line and it's just so light. No, actually, oh, here we go. We've answered our question. Right here, right here, we can see some overlap that was left, which means that these lines on the hat, these hatching lines were done in a colored line because it got over top of probably, I, I can't say for sure because digital art, you can never quite know what filters will do. But for the most part, I'm pretty sure based on this analysis that at least these lines were actually done in a color instead of black. Everything else appears to be black. Uh, Tangible says that I think it's black. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think that the majority of it is definitely black. But right here specifically, that leads me to believe that at least some of them, they probably did in color, which is very interesting. But these are the things, like, isn't this cool? I, I, I'm sorry if I'm just going to geek out for a minute, but isn't this cool? This is amazing. Like, look at what you get to learn when you really dig deep into these. I think it's super cool. I'm having fun, which is more than I can say with a lot of my art career. This this is super cool. I really enjoy this. Okay, so what are our takeaways from this piece? Because we need to keep moving. What are we at? An hour and six minutes. Oh, man. Around that hour mark is when I can really feel my throat starting to get tickly. But we'll keep moving. What are we going to, what are our takeaways from this piece? Well, first of all, we've, we uh, once again have seen that the um, contrast in line weight and line, uh, yeah, and tone of line is going to be important. I want to, in my own work, put in differing line qualities and stuff. Now, one thing to note here is that we do have a couple more what I would call seeking lines, not so much around the outsides, but when we're talking about like shading, especially you can see it on these sheep, there are some more seeking feeling lines. I think that they did this mostly for texture, but there are a couple lines in here that do feel like that kind of seeking. Uh, whereas the exterior, it has elements too where, where there's a little bit of seeking, but not a lot just a little bit. And so I think that that's really interesting. That's something I'll have to continue to keep in mind. Uh, but for the most part, these lines are pretty confident and they're finished and they're final inked lines. So that's something to keep in mind too. I really like this piece overall. Um, I have the sister piece to this uh, in my collection of absolutely top, uh, top favorites of all time but we'll get to that another day. Okay. Let's move on to this piece. Man, getting tired. Okay. Um, this piece is compelling for a number of reasons. One of which is the gray scales that they used the, uh, for lack of a better word, the color. Um, it's hard to use the word color here because it's just gray scales, right? But the differing shades of gray, is one of the reasons this is so appealing. But again, we got to come back to line alone. We got to just talk about line for a minute. So when it comes to line in this piece, what we'll see is that we do have a lot more seeking in this one than we did in the others. You can see it right here where there's some seeking. I'm not, it's not that I'm not sure where the line goes, but I want to make sure that it's, it's correct. Uh, so we want to keep that in mind. Here you can kind of see that seeking here. There's a little bit of extra that's just that not quite 100% finished quality, or, or I don't want to even say finished because that's not the right word. Not quite 100% polished to death, right? It's not so clean that you don't feel that human element to it to a degree. Um, the other thing we can see is that you can see it here. This line is also solid. It's not a textured line. So again, that kind of confirms my thought that I don't want to necessarily use a textured line. We have a lot of different line weights in this thing. We have some cross hatching in a lot of spots. Um, little tiny bit in the nose here. 
which is interesting. I don't know how I feel about cross hatching in terms of my own work. I haven't really gotten that far yet to to think about cross hatching, but it's nice to see that that's in here. Uh, it may be an element I eventually incorporate. I don't know, but of all the pieces that we've seen so far, uh, I would say that these two have the line quality that I'm looking for more than this one does. But all of them share a lot of commonalities, so it's hard for me to say. Um, but there's aspects of this that I really like. You'll also note that there are plenty of places in this one, like right here at the top of the lip and the shading on the nose and the bridge of the nose and under the chin, uh, where there is no line. So again, it, it, again, it reinforces that idea that I don't want to do exclusively line. I would like elements where there's just color next to color and not, not necessarily everything's defined with a line. If we go to this piece here, one of the things that appeals to me most about this piece is the colors or are the colors. I love the coloring on this piece, but again, we're not talking about color today. So I got to look at just the lines. So what can we look at just in terms of line? Well, again, line weight variety is, is just here in spades. Look at this leaf in the center and look at the exterior of the leaf. That is very different in terms of weight of line. And I love that. It's really nice. It, it, it pulls your attention. It grounds it. If we look at the eyeballs, the line weight around the eyeballs is very differently. I or is, is weighted differently. And I think that the artist probably went back and added extra line. Like they probably did the whole eyeball as one weight. Oops. And then they went back and added extra around the edge. I would guess if I had to guess, uh, which is good to know for technique because it will change things uh, how you draw based on that. Uh, Haile says, I like the colors in this one. I agree. Oh, man, I could just stare at these colors all day. If, if I ever get as good as this artist uh, is in color, I'll be so happy. <laughs> but got a lot of work to do before then color is my weakest area i think because i worked in black and white exclusively for years and years and years and years uh color is a mystery to me i'm only now trying to learn how it works that mystery okay so in terms of line though sorry i get distracted by color uh in terms of line this is a really nice piece because it's got that sense of a bit of roughness right in places like here You've got this, this little bit that's not quite finished or over here, you've got this little bit that kind of uh, edges past the, uh, the next line. So you have that quality, that little bit of roughness to it that I love. Uh, this leaf, or uh, maybe not, uh, zoomed out, this leaf does have that, that, that rough quality. It's, it's got like, it's just, it's that human element. I really like that human element. So we're gonna make sure that we, we have that. I'm going to write it down so I don't forget. Human element to, we'll call it rough edges in spots because I don't want it all to be super rough. I'm going to jot that down so I don't forget because the other elements that we've talked about so far, I think I'm going to remember, but this one I'll forget if I don't if I don't write it down, because it's just kind of like, oh yeah, and then that other thing. Um, hopefully I'll remember what that means and I can write it down uh, in my main goal list later. Okay, let's talk about this piece. This piece, in my opinion, is vastly different, and I shouldn't say vastly, but it feels very different than the other pieces. Why? Well, because the line work in this one is thick, and thin, but it's like painterly almost. If we really look at this line work, right? Like look at this, just this shoulder part, or, or look in here, we have this painterly aspect. It doesn't feel necessarily like ink or like, well, no ink. It doesn't feel like ink or pencil. It feels like paint because this artist did something different and actually has the name of it. Uh, name of the artist right there, got a tattoo. Um, but it feels very different. Now, I like aspects of this. The question is, do I want this to be my style? Is this what I want to incorporate in my style? That's the question. 
And so I have to, I have to remember to separate out liking something and wanting to incorporate it in my own work. Cause there's going to be a lot of beautiful art that I see that it's just not what I'm going to do. Um, we'll talk later about that element of having to set aside some things because you're a human being and you're only on this planet for a certain length of time. And so there are going to be things you have to not do in your life. There are going to be styles that you just don't try to master because you don't have time. Uh, I'm 40. So as I get older, I see that more and more. I have to focus on what I really want to master because I can't just try everything anymore. I can, I can try everything, but I'm never, I'm probably never going to master everything. Like nobody's going to do that. So I want to be specific. So going back to this piece, do I want that element of like painterly to be part of my style? I'm not sure yet. I'm still thinking about that one. I see the benefit. I see the appeal. But I think something in me that was always drawn to that line art doesn't want to go full on painter. And maybe this is the happy medium, right? Maybe this is the happy medium between a totally painterly style and then something that's very line heavy. Maybe this is it, but I don't know. Uh, initially, my thought is this isn't quite what I want. The lines are too painterly. They're too thick. They're just not what I'm looking for in terms of my own style. But that said, I love this piece. I think it's really pretty. I think it's beautiful. I think it has such qualities. And there's a lot about this that we'll probably analyze in the future. Uh, Midhan has a question. So let's jump over there before we get to the next piece. It says, how can I choose the right color combinations for my art? Great question. Wish I had a, an exact answer for you. But let me share a few thoughts on that. I know this isn't the color episode, which there will probably be a thousand of those. But uh, let's talk about color for just a second, and then we'll get back to line. A lot of color, what I'm finding... Uh, now, let me put it this way instead. There are two ways to approach color. There's almost a mathematical way. And then there is a, a sort of instinctual way. Okay. So you can dive very deep into color theory. When I went to art school, we had like three color theory classes. And we analyzed the heck out of color. And at that point in my life, I just didn't care. I didn't want to approach it from a strictly mathematical perspective. I just, it wasn't interesting to me. I just wanted to do art. So I think if I had had a teacher that almost taught a more instinctual style of color, it probably would have benefited me back then. That said, I don't think one way is right and one way is wrong. I just think it's a different approach. So it may help you as you're learning to choose the right color combinations for your art to step back for a second and say, do I approach this more from a math standpoint? And when, by my math, I mean looking at color theory, hardcore color theory, numbers, right? We can calculate numbers on an RGB scale and things like that now. Do I approach it more in that way? Or do I put two colors next to each other and set, step back and say, do I like that, right? Because that's the thing. Um, let me give you, do I do this now or do I do it later? Let's just do it now real quick. Uh, all right. Yeah. Nuts. Uh, you guys don't mind if we tangent for a second, right? Ferdinand said he never minds tangenting. So we're going to do that. All right. Let's, uh, let's talk about something real quick when it comes to color. I'm going to choose this color. The reason I chose that color is because I just landed on it. I, I opened up the color picker. I clicked on something and I clicked on something else and I, I did that color. Okay. I don't know if that's a nice color. I don't know if that's a bad color. I don't know anything about that color. I just picked it as a starting point. But let's say that this is my starting color. For whatever reason, this is my starting color. If I want a color combination that works well with this, here's what I'll do. I'll start. This is one way. There are a thousand ways to do that. But because I tend to be instinctual in my art, which is weird because I'm sitting here with you guys analyzing everything to death. But when I'm doing art, I tend to be a little more instinctual, and then I go back and analyze later. So you can blend both. But because I'm more instinctual with my art, what I could do is I can go over here and I can grab this pink. And again, I just clicked on random things. I, I did not pick that for any reason other than I just did it. And I can put this pink down 
right here next to it on a separate layer. Okay, so we have this green and this pink. Is this a nice color scheme? I don't think so. I honestly think this is kind of ugly, but I only think that, right? I'm not sitting here analyzing it. I'm just thinking that's kind of ugly. So what can I do? Well, I can either alter the green or I can alter the pink just to see what the difference is. See what happens. We're going to experiment. We're going to play a little bit. And this is one of the things that I've always lacked in art. And I've only learned in the past maybe handful of months even is this idea of playing, seeing, throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what happens. So we're just going to play. So let's go with. So, OK, let, let me step back for a second. If I look at these two, the thing that bugs me more is the green. I don't mind that purplish pink. That purplish pink is kind of nice to me. But I don't like the green next to it. I might have liked the green by itself, but I don't like the green next to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to select the green layer. And this is one of the beauties of digital art. Normally, you would do this with paint. You would just keep mixing paint until you found what worked. But we could do it even faster. And I'm going to go to hue, saturation, brightness. OK? And then I'm going to just start playing with this hue slider. What happens if I make this green uh, more towards the orangish tone, right? So let's say I put it there. Do I like this better or worse than this? I could flip back and forth by just undoing and redoing over and over. Which do I like more? Well, I'm not sure I like either of those more. Um, so let's let's stop and go in the other direction. What if we move it more towards blue? Well, now we're getting something rather interesting. I kind of like this better. Now, I don't know about you because this is very instinctual for me, but I like this better. Yeah, it's still not there. There's something about it that's not, not working. So let's go over to the saturation slider, and we can start moving that around. What happens if we take down the saturation? Do we like this better? Do we like this worse? What happens if we turn up the saturation? Do we like that better or worse? They're still getting some clashing and some contrast here, so let's go over to the brightness slider. What happens if we lighten this? Do we like it better or worse? Oh, well, now personally, I'm starting to dig this a lot more than that original green. This speaks to me more. Is it still weird, kind of? Like, there's still some clashing that's going on here, but I almost like that clashing. I almost like it. So in a certain element, I would kind of dig that. But we might go in the other direction. We might turn it to uh, bring down the darkness, and we might see how that works. And then maybe once we bring down the darkness, maybe we drop the saturation some, and then maybe we go back to the hue slider again, and we start to play around with that and see, oh, well, what can we do? What can we change? And this is an approach that... Um, I think is really useful. Uh, Hiley says, colors with different hues, but the same light and saturation tend to look awkward. That is accurate. And, and see, that's more of a theory approach, right? That's good to know. It's good to know your theory. It's really important to know this stuff because it can help you to avoid certain mistakes. But at the same time, you don't necessarily need the theory initially or while you're working, because if you just want to step back and feel colors, and get an idea of what you like and what you dislike, that's okay too some of the time. You need a balance of both, right? Because it really helps to, to know what Hailey said here as to the why some things are working and why they're not. But at the same time, don't forget to play a little bit and have some fun and, and try some things. And I hope that that's helpful. I hope that that will give you an idea of things. It gets obviously much more complicated when you add more and more and more and more and more colors. I will talk more about color another day. But I appreciate you letting me go on that bit of a tangent. And we'll uh yes, I do. And we'll go back to some line discussion. Oh, we don't want blocking brush. Okay. Uh coming up on the home stretch here, down the down the last few. Um let's take a look at this bottom one in the left corner. This is what I would say of all of them is the cleanest in terms of line. Because if you really zoom in and you look at the edges and and there, let, let me see for a second if I could see anywhere that they, in some of this lighting, you can see that there's a roughness. But in the exterior outline of this creature, I do not see any of that, what I would call human element that is something extra rough or, or where line went away from what they intended. This is extraordinarily clean. Now, 
Is that what I want for my art? I don't think so at this point. I don't think this is what I want for my art. However, what I will say is that this has elements that I definitely would love in at least some of my art because some of my art is done for game design. And to me, this suits game design very well, this piece. I'm not exactly sure what it was designed for, if it was just for fun, if it was for a story or whatever, but uh, this to me screams perfect for a, a, a wonderful 2D game. So I don't want to limit myself to just that one style in that regard where I can only ever do a more rough line. There are times when I'm going to want to do a very uh, clean line. So I showed you earlier when we were talking about textured lines versus smooth lines, I showed you that picture of that weird little creature Tongs, that orange guy. That is one of the sprites for an upcoming weekend panda game that I'm working on. I want to be able to still do that. I want to be able to go back to that when I need to, but it's not going to be my default necessarily. Uh, somebody in chat says, hi, hello, welcome to the chat or welcome to the live stream. So regarding this image, I love how clean it is. I want to be able to do this, but I don't want it to be my default. Because once upon a time, this would have been like more of my ideal de default, and it no longer is. Uh, because I don't want it so crisp and clean that it feels that sort of sprightly. I don't, I don't, I'd have to think of the word that, uh, that would describe it. But it, uh, it isn't what I want as my default style anymore. So that's good to know. And that's the sort of thing that I need to recognize. That being said, we're probably going to come back to this piece in the past because there's so much about this piece that I love from the lighting and the, the shading and the, ah, oh, there's so much about this piece I love. So we'll be, we'll be back, random weird little crystal bug. But for now, we're going to set you aside because the line isn't, isn't exactly what I want out of the work that I'm going to do. Okay. Here we have some work by Toby Allen and Toby Allen's going to creep into our color discussions a thousand and one times because by golly, his coloring is astounding. I, I cannot speak highly enough about his coloring. It's so nice. Oh, I can't wait to analyze that, but we're not talking about color today. Well, we did, but we're not talking about it anymore. We're talking about line. So let's zoom in here and we'll talk about some lines. So the first thing that I think that is useful to note is that the line weight here on most of the line appears to be pretty consistent, right? It's not as tapered. It's, it doesn't have that fluctuation and that variety in line weight as we saw before. We get that contrast a little more because of some other things that he's done such as color, such as shading, such as going back through with additional detail like this that is lighter and has contrast in line quality. But if we look at just the line, like right here on the arm, the difference in, in line weight is very minimal. It's very minimal. It's almost consistent throughout. Or if we look here at these edges of the, the leaves, the line weight is very consistent and that's good and that's okay. And it's, it's nice and I, uh, pleasing. The question then becomes, is this what I want to do? The answer there I think is no, because as we've established already, I want that contrast in, in line weight in my default style. However, that being said, let's talk about what this piece does that I would want to incorporate in terms of line. One thing that I love about this piece is that that he went back through and added additional lines that had a different line weight, right? These ex interior lines compared to the exterior ones have different weight to them, which is really nice. And this is something that personally I'm missing in my work. I can tell you right now for sure, this is what I have not done. Uh, I haven't practiced and I haven't done it well yet. And this is what I need to learn and I need to incorporate. So. I put my Foxtrot book away. Um, if we go back to that Foxtrot image and that art, remember it was very consistent in line weight, 
but it was kind of consistent throughout. It was it was interior and exterior. And because it's a comic and it needs to be, you know, this big on a piece of newsprint, he had to to lose some detail in order to keep it graphic and in order to keep it readable. Whereas with this piece, if you shrunk it down into a comic, all those little details would get lost if if the printer, uh, the printing ink could even handle any of it at all. It would get lost. It would. So it's a completely different mindset. And because I never worked in this idea of let's add a bunch of little lines and details within the bigger shapes, I have to practice that. That's something that I need to learn. So this is a really good piece for that. Uh, this is going to be a great piece to look at when it comes time to talk about color and lighting and things. But for now, I think we've pulled what we can out of the line aspect of it. And the things that we learned from this, or I learned, is... Uh, it's pretty consistent in the exterior lines. That's great, but it's not what I want to do. But it also goes back in and adds uh, a quality of variety and contrast in the interior lines. And that is something that I would love to do going forward, if it fits the piece and that sort of thing. We have two more, and then we will uh, wrap up this part and go into the Q&A. So if you have questions, start thinking about them. All right, let's talk about this piece. Interestingly, I added this piece last night. I had prepared this lecture, I think Saturday, because uh, I just wanted it to be ready for you guys. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I prepared the lecture portion Saturday. I got this piece together like a week or two weeks ago before I even started live streaming this stuff, uh, just because this is what I was going to analyze. But this piece I added last night. This piece I came across, I'm pretty sure I have it. I had it already saved. If I go scroll through my gallery, I'm pretty sure I'm going to find duplicates of this one, but that's okay. Um, but I added it last night because there was something that I wanted to look at because there's something really compelling to me about this piece. What you'll see in this piece are a couple things. First of all, if we look at the, uh, the line color, you will see, uh, I need some white to do this. You will see that here we have this color which if we look at the color picker, because it's easier, you're going to see that it's this bluish color. If we go here, what you'll see is we have this color, which, wow, it looks very similar, but whoa, if you go to the color picker, it's very different. We're in the reds now, and we've just abandoned the blues. And then if we go down here to this color, we would have this, which, again, we're in the reds, but we've moved slightly. We've moved to a different spot. And uh, where else do we have anything? Uh, well, we could take the face. If we take the edge of the face color, that's when we get the most extreme example. And obviously you can see that's different. So what I think is really compelling about this piece or what I want to take away from it is that here is an artist who, if you just looked at this piece, you might say, I mean, just glancing at the piece, you might say, oh, that artist worked in black line, but they didn't. They just worked in colored line that in most places reads as black because of the contrast and because of how deep the uh, the tones went in order uh, uh, when they colored the lines i would bet i'd bet dollars to donuts that this artist worked in black or whatever color line exclusively and then they went back at the end and they recolored the lines of the piece which i think is what i'm going to be shooting for of all the pieces that we've seen today, I think this one is closest to what I'm probably going to shoot for. I don't know that yet, but I'm thinking that that might be the case. Because what you see here is a lot of contrast in line, which I love. You've got a uh, different color of line, which I'm leaning towards rather than all black. I'm not sure. But again, this is an experiment. This is a learning process. So I'm just guessing as I go. But there, uh, this this is this is close. I think this is close. And um, what you'll see here is that the line is pretty clean overall, right? Uh, we don't have a lot of those searching lines. I'm sure that I am almost positive that the that the artist did a whole underdrawing before they just jumped into final lines. And you guys know what I mean by underdrawing, right? Like that's where your uh, you're doing your forms and your shapes and your your measurements and things and you're figuring stuff out before you 
you jump into your finals um, like this, right? You're doing stuff like that. Then you're dropping down your opacity or whatever, and you're going in your next one, and maybe you're getting you're getting closer, and so you're going to start doing your more clean lines, and you're going to figure out, you know, does this work or does this not work and that sort of thing. And when you're getting to your eyes, you're going to have to actually make them realize instead of just dots or, you know, you could keep them as, as they are or whatever. And you're, whoop, maybe you're sculpting the nose a little bit more. And uh, I have to be careful because I could just sit here and do this all day. But that's what I mean. Like it, they're not jumping straight to this final line. Here, they're not. Um, the only, well, I shouldn't say only. If you get very good at one particular style or something, it's possible that you could just do final lines immediately. Uh, the animator Milk Call was known for this. Later in his life, he would sit there and stare at the page. He would just stare at it. And I think what he was doing was formulating all of these rough lines in his head. And then he would just work cleanly. And it was amazing. And everybody would gather around and be like, how are you doing that? Like, how is this happening? <laughs> so, um, but going back to what I was talking about here, the artist almost almost assuredly had seeking lines. They they worked roughly to get this. They, they made sure that everything was where they wanted it to be, the proportions, the appeal, all that stuff, the details. And then they went back and inked it. And then on top of going back and inking it, they probably went back and colored the lines of the inking. As a result, you get this very crisp, clean, nice, appealing look. Uh, really nice style. I'm a big fan. Uh, again, right now, I'm thinking that this is probably a, the closest of anything that I've found, or at least of this collection, that brings all these elements together that I really like. And I'm, I'm very grateful that I found this last night. And got to put it in there because it's going to kind of give you guys an idea of what I'm talking about. The other thing that I would note here is that there are still some rough areas, right? We're not talking 100% clean. It's got some cross hatching here and stuff. And there are some elements of the seeking line still. And I love that. It's got that, that, that touch to it, that human element that we talked about earlier. I don't see it so much in terms of exterior lines. Uh, it's almost added on top. So, well, maybe here, maybe here there's a little bit, eh, maybe not though. It's, it's pretty clean at any rate. Um, that, uh, that's that piece. And I really like it. I really dig that piece. And it's going to probably be it. I will say this. I, if I, if that ended up being my default style or something similar to that, cause it's still not hundred percent there, but if it's something similar to that, I would be pretty pleased. I think. I think I would be pleased. There are other aspects that I might not do, but in terms of line, that's that's really nice. Okay, last one. This one, uh, as you can see, almost, uh, so the exterior lines are almost exclusively black, right, around the forms. But then when you get to the interior line, so this line is black and this line is black and this line is black, but, and this line is black because it's technically an exterior. But if you get to the interior lines, like this ear part, this is where the artist used color lines. And then if we go over here, you can see there's spots that don't have any line at all. Like there's a tiny bit of line for the bottom of the lip, that kind of shadow and shape, but that uh, around it, there's no line. Um, the shading, there's no line. This shading, there's no line. So there's a lot of nice balance here, I think, between line and no line. And then there's also a lot of nice balance between having a black thick line uh, with some varying weights and also uh, having some consistency. Um, you've got tapering, but you've also got some nice consistency. So this is a really, I think this is a cool piece. This may be a little more graphic than I want to go um, with all of that black. That's a lot of black line. And I think that what this piece tells me is that I want to just be careful, be conscious about how much black line I use because I think that I would maybe, it's not that I would like this piece more if it didn't have so much black line. It's more like the style I want to produce probably doesn't have quite as much of that graphic quality. Maybe, I don't know. 
I have to think about this one more because this piece is so graphic in terms of color that it's hard to it's hard to analyze because I'm just keep getting drawn back to the color aspect. Anyway, we'll see. Okay, so uh, so let's let's recap. Let's talk about our takeaways here, and then we'll do our Q and A. What did we learn today? Okay, well, one thing we learned. The first thing we learned, I think, is that for my style, and I say we, but I apologize. This is really for my style. So I, I appreciate you guys coming along for the ride. I hope it's useful for you too, but I'm I'm obviously being very selfish here because I'm talking about my style. Um, for my style, going forward, I want to have contrast of line weight. I want to have that blend like this first one had where you have some that are thick and then some that are nice and thin. But I want to use line. We, we established that before. I don't want to do lineless art right now. That's just not what I'm after. And I also don't want to do just line. So that's good to know too. But regarding the uh, line weight, I want to have a variety of line weight. I want to go back and put in texture via line, such as the sheep. Um, I like that. When it comes to seeking line versus uh, fully finished inked line, I kind of like just a hint of the seeking line, right? I don't want it to be necessary. I don't want, okay, let me say one more thing. Uh, it's important to distinguish completely finished pieces with rough pieces because I'm not going to stop doing rough pieces and I'm not going to stop sharing rough pieces. Sometimes I'll do rough pieces and that will just be done and I'll move on to the next piece. But when I'm talking about my style, I want, I'm trying to, uh, describe this final illustration that I'll make, right? Like if I was going to do a piece and then hang it on my wall that I said, this is done. This is as done as I can do almost. Uh, I would want that line quality to have elements of the seeking line, elements of that roughness, that human element, right? That we, that we wrote about over here, but I don't want it to be super rough. Um, Maybe next time I'll pull some images that that showcase that super roughness. That's not what I want. That's not what I'm looking for in my final work. Uh, with this little guy, again, we, we talked about that human element, that rough edges, those little bits that kind of poke out or don't don't connect all the way. They're not perfect. Uh, so I want to shoot for I want to shoot for non-perfection, I guess. That would be a weird way to put it, but it's true. Uh, this piece, again, I really like, but this isn't going to be my default style. There are elements that we'll talk about later that I really enjoy and I want to keep. Uh, boy, there's shape out the wazoo in this piece. It's so beautiful in that regard. But line-wise, not, not what I'm going to end up doing, and that's okay. Uh, again, here we have line-wise, not what I'm going to end up doing, and that's okay. But some of the time I will do this. I'm hopeful that I can do stuff like this because... This graphic quality fits very well for game design, and that's one of my uh, jobs in life, uh, the artist at Weekend Panda. So I need to be able to do not just one particular thing. It's just not going to be my default, maybe. This is what will happen when I specifically try to make a sprite for a game. Um, this one, we learned that I, I don't want, Again, I'm just kind of reiterating here. I don't want that super consistency of line quality. However, with this one, what I learned was I do want to add in a contrasting thickness and weight of line interior to the exterior shapes and things. And then, I mean, this one's just beautiful. And there's a lot, lot to be said here, uh, especially regarding the coloring of the lines and how it just adds that extra little bit of depth that I really like. Um, so... So a lot of lessons here today. I think I've got a lot to write down in my files. Um, and so then we'll we'll go from there. Next time, uh, we're going to jump into the Q&A next. So let me I'll put that up in the corner and then we can just chat. Um, so sorry, I should, I, you guys know what we're doing. So, but this, these little pop-ups, tend to be useful for if you're watching afterwards and you're scrubbing through the uh, the video so you can find when certain things start. So I don't mind pop, popping them up, but forgive me if I have to find them on the page. Um, 
Uh, I will say that next time, I'm not exactly sure what we're going to be looking at because I'm kind of playing it by ear, but I have a bunch of other files. We can, we can look at them real quick. Or I, So I have all these different ones to go through and we've only gone through the first two. So there's a lot to talk about still, but uh, I'm thinking that it'll probably be on form and, and shape and chunkiness. Uh, the word I, I use is chunkiness and we'll, we'll see how it goes. All right. So Q and a, if anybody has any questions and I missed them, please let me know. Uh, and then we'll, I'll go through some of the one, uh, the comments that I, Potentially missed, CW says, a basic understanding of color of the color wheel is a good thing to know when you're stuck, but also just taking colors from artwork that you like as the effect you want in them already. Yeah, so we can definitely learn from artists who have come before us or who are still learning alongside us. Uh, there is nothing at all wrong with taking an image you love and pulling colors from it to see why they work together well and what they are where I would advise against, and you just have to be careful, don't take a piece that has beautiful colors and then just use those colors exactly in your own work. And it's, it's, it's a fine line there. You just gotta be really careful because there, there's a point where it's just flat out steel and their stuff. Um, but at the very least, take, uh, take your color picker, look at what they did, look at those colors near each other and see what it's doing. And then, you know, you can modify them slightly and then use them in your own work and stuff. But just you just gotta watch. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of art is uh, borrowing or flat out stealing or whatever. But you just you, you just want to be wise about it. You don't want to. They worked hard for their colors probably, so you don't want to just flat out steal them. But I agree. Um, when you're stuck, especially take colors from other art that you like, play with them, just play with them and see what happens, and then mess with them a bit. Uh, that way you can call them your own in that way. Um, Let's see what else we've got. John, John says, I've been studying a ton of animators, inks and texture mark techniques using line. I'm also mostly just using line in my work right now. Yeah. So that's another thing I would say. If you're working in 3D animation, then obviously you're working in 3D animation. But if you're doing 2D, you're probably going to be working a lot with line, probably, uh, especially early on. It's not impossible to work with just swatches of color, like a, a painterly effect. You could do that, but it's in a sense easier initially, especially in 2D animation, to just work with line. Um, just make sure that while you're doing that, you don't fall into the trap that I did, where suddenly you you do it just without being able to do anything else. I guess you know what I mean. You just you just want to be careful that you don't fall into that trap of of not being capable of of going outside of what you're doing but i agree um studying other animators line quality is great because animators not only work in line so much 2d specifically but they have to use so much line right it's not like an illustrator where you're you're doing one beautiful piece you have to do frame after frame after frame after frame of line and line and line and line. So you get much better and more confident in those lines. Because if you sat there for every frame and you're just super careful and, and worried, you're doomed. You're never going to finish anything because you have to draw too much. You do. You just have to draw too much. You can't You can't be that, that timid. You have to just start putting down lines. And then if it doesn't work, you erase that line, you put down a new line. Um, one of the things I love about traditional 2D animation on paper is it lend it, it loans itself to that idea where you're just like scratching lines and you're like, no, that's not the right line. No, that's not the right line. No, that's not the right line. And you don't really have time to erase. You're just putting line after line after line. If you go look up some of Glenn Keane's work, uh, I really like Glenn Keane, both as an artist and a human being. Glenn Keane is amazing. Um, but you look up his his. Uh, some of his roughs, they are so rough. It's, it's almost like you can't even see what's happening, but you can because he finally settles on, like he drives home that point, those lines, and it's it's beautiful stuff. Uh, not what I would want to do, but it's beautiful, and I, I think it's really worth checking out. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, oh, this is a good one. Okay, CW says, if the art is for animation, lots of internal line, 
work around shadows and et cetera could be problematic. If it's just for static illustration, no problem, what you agree. I absolutely agree. When you are designing for animation, especially hand-drawn 2D, uh, you can get away with it a lot more now with digital tools, especially 3D. But if you're designing for hand-drawn 2D, be very careful about how many details you add. I am not designing my style for animation at all. I can always kind of parse back. I can I can pull back from my what I would call full style and take away details if I'm if I um, but my problem right now is I spent most of my life only doing the more simplistic style and only doing less detailed work, which worked great for animation, as you say. But now that I want to do some pieces for my wall, essentially, like to put it no other way, I want to add that that richness of extra texture and complexity and things. But you are absolutely right. If you're going to be designing for animation, this is Animator Island after all, make sure that you're careful about details you add because every detail that you put in is going to have to be drawn 70,000 times <laughs> and kept consistent 70,000 times. And so, especially when you're doing early work, be very careful about how much detail you add. Uh, just be careful. All right, um, we got, I think, two more, two more questions, and then we're going to wrap up for the day because we're approaching that beautiful two-hour mark. I really thought it would be quicker today, but no, it's probably never going to be quicker. Okay, apologies, I can't pronounce your name. Um, it, is it difficult to create backgrounds that match the style of the character in the animation? Uh, uh, sometimes. <laughs> it depends. It, it dramatically depends. If there's a lot of there's a lot of things to answer in this question. So first of all, I would say, if you are if you have a distinct style choices that you're making, whether it's your style or just the piece, uh, the animated film itself, once you know the elements that define it as that style, it's not hard to implement those into everything from backgrounds to objects, to characters, to everything. Like you can implement them. Um, an area where I think this is very apparent is the film Lilo and Stitch. If you go watch Lilo and Stitch or you go look up information about behind the scenes in Lilo and Stitch, you'll find that they had a sort of style guide that influenced so much of what they did. And as a result, it was a very cohesive world. It fit together well. It didn't necessarily match. Uh, it didn't match to a certain degree because you wanted to still have those characters pop off the background, which is the second part of my answer to you, which is, uh, is to say, you want it to match the style between character and background just enough that it doesn't feel like clashing, that it doesn't feel uncomfortable. I'd use that word. But you don't want it to match so well that you lose the character in, this, in the art, right? Because you have to have the background be a separate thing than the character. You have to. So you want to make sure that there's extra style almost in the character and not the background otherwise the character's going to get lost unless of course because there's always exceptions unless your story is very uh built around the setting in which case you might want to put more work into your backgrounds or more detail or more style into your backgrounds and less into your character if the story calls for it right but is it difficult to create backgrounds that match the style yes in general but much less difficult if you know what the style is and what makes that style the style. We just went through all these things. And so hopefully, eventually, I will know what my style is like. And in that case, I'll just start applying it to background items, right? So I'll be like, okay, well, one of the things that I want to do is have a variety of line weight. But because the background isn't the most important thing, maybe I'll have less line weight variety. Doesn't mean I'll take it away entirely probably, but it, it does mean that I will have less of it. Um, so as the more you know what the style is, uh, the easier it's going to become to make things consistent. And consistency in animation is a big thing. Oh my gosh, sometimes it's the only thing it feels like. All right. 
I think I'm going to go with the last question here and then we'll, uh, there's a couple more comments and I'll just read through them. But um, Azure says, would the video on shape and chunkiness also cover overall silhouette? That's a great question. I think now that you bring it up, oh, you've just added to my workload. Thanks for nothing. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm going to actually need to do one on silhouette, I think, exclusively. Uh, shape related to silhouette, because the answer to your question is no. Uh, the shape and chunkiness is going to be about form of almost interior alone. And I had never really thought about that, but that's a great question. Thank you for that question, because that is fantastic. I have I have work to do now because I'm going to have to go compile uh, something just on silhouette, on exterior shape. Huh, look at that. <laughs> well, I know what I'm doing this afternoon. Uh, Cool. No, the video on shape and chunkiness will not cover silhouette, but guess what? Now there's going to be a video on silhouette. So good job. Again, I really appreciate that question. That's amazing. Absolutely. Okay. Um, John says, thanks for the tips. Definitely we'll take them into account when studying. I'm glad you, you got something out of it. Uh, and then we have um, one more comment and then we're wrapping up. It says, reminds me of people say, oh, it's so easy. Just draw the character design. It's so easy. And I thought, or I was taught as a 2D animator, and they didn't say a word about character design. Yeah. Uh, you will hopefully, and if you do, if you hear this out of my mouth, you tell me so that I can, I can close my mouth. I will hope that you never hear me say this is easy, because it's not. Uh, for some people, this stuff comes more easily. For me, it does not. This is so hard for me. Like, I feel like I'm pulling teeth. It is so hard. Uh, but there's something there that compels me to do it. Um, something in the calling of my life says you're to pursue art. I don't know what it's about yet. Still learning. But, uh, oh, my gosh, it's not easy. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. If they say it's easy, what they mean is that it's easy for them. But for most people, it's not. There's a reason that most people are not artists. And it's not because they couldn't be. Because I'm pretty sure, for the most part, everybody could be an artist. The reason most people aren't artists is because it's monstrously difficult. Uh, it's so hard, you guys. <laughs> but, but if you are called to this thing that we call art, if this is what you were put on this planet to do, you're not going to be content if you don't do it. So... Even if it's hard, let's do it because it's worth it. It's it's just not worth pursuing something that you're not called to do. So cool. All right. Well, I hope that that was informative for everyone. It certainly was for me. Uh, the next live stream will probably be later this week. It will be either Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, and it will feature either me or Ferdinand because we haven't quite figured that out yet right now. I am leaning towards the next stream being Friday at 10 Eastern Standard Time, probably. I'm going to try for that. Uh, some, If anything comes up, I can't guarantee that that will be it. But if you want to mark your calendars, you can you can do that. Um, we'll see. If not, I, I believe Ferdinand is interested in doing another one later in the week. And usually Ferdinand will stream either Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. That's just what works for his schedule. In the event that uh, either one of us doesn't make it for the end of this week, I am going to do another stream next week, and we're probably going to talk about chunkiness and form, uh, probably. So you can look forward to that. And if you have any other questions, please uh, seek out this video in its recorded form on like YouTube and leave some comments. Ask your questions. I will try and reply to all of them if I can. And uh, if not, then we'll see you for next Q&A next time and next lecture and next application. And thanks again for everybody for hanging out and uh, watching the live stream or the recorded video if you do so afterwards. That's all for me today. I'm JK from Animator Island, and we'll see you next time. As Ferdinand would say, keep animating or drawing or whatever it is you're doing today. Bye, everybody.